on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Inside Politics. Hello, everyone. I'm News Channel 5's political analyst, Pat Nolan. Welcome to Inside Politics. This has been a remarkable week in this country as the nation has come together to mourn the passing of our 41st president, George Herbert Walker Bush. Two nice victims who worked closely with the president at times during his political career are our guests on Inside Politics this week. They are Republican political analysts Chip Saltzman and Bill Phillips. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the show to, sh to share your thoughts and, and remembrances of the president. Thank you. What have we lost, Bill, with the passing of, of a George Herbert Walker Bush? He was certainly an important politician in his day, but it seems many of the things he's, he, he, he did accomplish while he was there have kind of begun to be pushed aside by some of the current things going on. He, well, but the, there's a number of things that he accomplished that will be institutional forever, and one of them is the way that uh, we conduct foreign policy. Now, right now, that's a little hazy with some of the things that are going on in the world, but you've got that core of career employees that learned under uh, Herbert Walker Bush, and I think that will continue for a number of years. Chip, there was a kindness about him and being willing to reach across the aisle that we don't see as often in our politicians these days. Well, it was who he was, and it's how he uh, not only was raised, but it's how he raised his family. And, and you know, we saw a couple articles where it said it was important for President Bush, for President Trump to be there and some reporters were making it like that's a big deal. I never thought twice about it. Of course, he wanted everybody to be there. He wanted Republicans and Democrats. Uh, he knew what this would mean for the country uh, years before that he passed away. Now, Bill, there was some harsh words said, particularly by the current president, about the Bush family, particularly back during his campaign and since then. So uh, that took some doing for the president to do that. I suspect he might have had to do some things with inside his own family to get that to work because the president was not invited to the John McCain's funeral. Well, I do think that um, it was natural for him to invite everybody in the club of ex-presidents uh, and then the current president. But I also think it was typical George Bush. He actually got the last uh, word in <laughs> by reaching out and inviting somebody who had been very rude and everybody was very aware of it. Uh, and so it put the president in an interesting position, I think. Uh, Chip, it was interesting. He was also a person who didn't like to talk about himself too much. And uh, John Meacham, the, the Nashville historian, presidential historian, gave a eulogy and actually had shared that with the president before he passed. And George Bush's reaction was, awful lot about George in that. <laughs> well, it's his eulogy. What else would you talk about? But that's, but that's typical of George Bush, isn't it, it? Typical of George Bush and typical of that greatest generation. They didn't want to talk about what they had done or what they've done, uh, you know, especially in the war. They didn't mm -hmm. want to talk about those things. They were always kind of looking forward. Uh, and I think it's interesting for us that were that had family uh, or parents or grandparents in that generation who did go to war. They didn't want to talk about the past. They always wanted to talk about the future. And I think that's what kind of made George Bush kind of a transformational president, even though he's only a one-termer. He was always thinking about the future, not the past. Well, in 1988 campaign, when he was running for president, we came across the footage of his rescue uh, for the su by the submarine crew, and it took quite a bit to convince him that this would be a good thing to publicize. And we were fighting the wimp factor at the time, uh, and so he was never really pleased with us doing it, but <laughs> finally consented. Bill, you had perhaps one of the most important roles in the president's political career. You were managing and were in control of the 1988 Republican convention where he was nominated for president. How did that come about? That's the first time anybody said I was in control of the convention. <laughs> well, but <laughs> anybody can be in control of right. the convention. Well, I had worked <laughs> as his um, director of his political action committee, and then the RNC, uh, with his permission, tapped me to go in actually to replace someone who hadn't worked out. Uh, and I assumed all along, once we had a nominee, because remember we had up to 10 candidates in the primary at one time, that that person would designate their manager. Uh, when he secured the nomination, I got a call from Lee Atwater, uh, who was working for him, and said that the, the boss would like for you to continue as the manager, which I appreciate it a great deal. Do you work with him a on a day-to-day -day basis to plan the convention and during the convention? I mean, I, everything that happened at the convention, even if you weren't in complete control of it, was so important to setting up his image going into the campaign. I worked uh, on a daily basis with uh, his convention liaison, Fred Malik, 
Um, I didn't see the pre uh, vice pre then vice president that often, but uh, he loved to have a briefing on the logistics, and I took a big map of what the floor of the convention would look like, and he meekly asked, would it be okay if I kept this? I said, you can do anything you want to, Mr. Dodge. <laughs> so it's in his library probably yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Huh? Uh, Chip, I think your first involvement with the president was during the uh, the, the Bush quail campaign Correct. in 92. Yeah. Uh, you didn't have a high level no, position, I, I, but, but when you met him, he treated you like you were a big Well, man. I always told people, I said, if George Bush was at the top of the organizational chart, I was underneath the bottom of the organizational <laughs> chart. I was the <laughs> assistant West Tennessee field coordinator uh, for the campaign, and I'm pretty sure there wasn't an actual Tennessee <laughs> coordinator or West Tennessee coordinator. Uh, I was basically the yard sign guy because I had a truck and I could put all the signs yeah. in the truck. But <laughs> when, when I first met him, uh, you know, he, he made it seem like that I might have had a job almost as important as Bill's. I mean, it was, it was thank you for everything you're doing. This is really important. And, you know, the first time you meet a president, uh, you just sit there. You don't say much. Uh, you just are kind of impressed that the president actually is talking to you. And it was a two-minute conversation, but I'm pretty sure for the first time, and it'll shock both of you, I didn't say a word. <laughs> that is a shock. <laughs> but we, How did we, that we, <laughs> <laughs> But we did keep him humble, that's yeah, for sure. That's, tough. that's a tough gig, too. Yeah, I was assistant campaign manager for operations, so I, too, was in charge of signs and yard yes. signs and such. So. Bill, you worked. You must have done a good enough job at 88 that you've been asked back to work on a multiple conventions. It's a unique American um, creation to do these conventions, and they've changed over the years, but I guess the essence of it has not. Well, the circus used to be the greatest show on earth, but now political conventions are, and that's what they've evolved into is a four-night uh, soap opera. Um, unfortunately, the system is such now that some of the drama is gone, so you have to create some drama uh, in some of the conventions. Our last really um, controversial convention was probably uh, 92, right. when uh, Pat Buchanan spoke. Right. And there, there are some of us who didn't think that was a good idea, but we didn't get to vote. Well, yeah. The 88 convention, and particularly his acceptance speech, has probably lived on more than most other acceptance speeches. First, within, there was a couple things in it that sort of mirrored his political career. First was the thousand points of light comment was in there. That was a big part of the speech. He also had a comment in there that came back to haunt him, which was the read my lips, no new taxes. But that sort of a bill maybe sort of summarized, on the one hand, his, his kindness and gentleness, and then also his competition. He, in, maybe in some cases being so competitive he might say some things that maybe later looking back on it he wished he hadn't said. Well, and that's one of them. He wished he hadn't said it that way. And it's interesting, usually you can find some speechwriter who will claim uh, credit for a great line. No one will uh, say that Nobody they credit suggested that one. That one. Well, no, but Peggy uh, Noonan wrote that speech, yeah. right? Did she not get a lot of she, credit for doing she that wrote, speech? Uh, she wrote the speech, but it's unclear where that line came <laughs> from. I'll put it that Just way. Showed up. And I have great admiration for Peggy Noonan. Um, sure. But he was was extremely competitive and I learned that my first day on the job working for him uh, at the political action committee. So. Bill Phillips is our guest along with Chip Soffin. We're looking back on the life and career of President George w. Herbert Walker Bush who just passed away this past week. The nation's been mourning that all week. Back to continue our conversation with, with our guests after this break.